Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, thank you for braving the elements as well. It's a particular pleasure for me and the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra to be welcoming one of the real giants in our field, uh, creative polymath, if you will, producer, conductor, clarinetist, composer now, Michael Fine. I'll start with just a little bit about Michael, and you, it, you'll find that there are not enough superlatives to really uh, completely depict his accomplishments, but particularly as a producer. He's a seven-time Grammy Award winner. He's won virtually every major award in the, uh, that you can win as a producer. He's the only American to ever be the artistic director. His official title, uh, Vice President of Artisan Repertoire of the venerable and 100-year label Deutsche Grammophon. And he has relationships and has worked regularly with a veritable who's who of the classical music world, whether that's orchestras like the London Symphony or the Vienna Philharmonic, or great soloists like René Capuçon or Anna-Sophie Mutler, or big platinum-selling albums with people like André Buccelli. And it's, it's, uh, it's a particular pleasure, as I mentioned, to have someone of his star power joining us here in Little Rock. And why don't we kick it off with a little discussion of what does producer even mean? Because if you are watching a movie or the Oscars or listening to a rap video, producer can mean a lot of things. What is mm. it for you in classical music? It's a very well-kept secret and we like it. <laughs> we, we like it that way uh, because we are very much behind the scenes. Many years ago, uh, my son came home from school and it was one of those days where they asked children, what do your parents do for work? My son had no idea. He said, something with music. So I invited him to come to a recording session that I was doing, and I put some headphones on him, and at the end of the day, he said, I know what you do. They pay you a lot of money to listen to music all day. <laughs> and I thought, that's a very good description, because the, instead of calling us producers, they should call us listeners. So we're... We're the ideal audience. So I'm the audience in one person with a pair of headphones on, listening to the music very, very carefully, uh, making comments that don't make us friends. Because normally, uh, recording studios are very expensive. Orchestras are expensive. Conductors, well, we know about them. Very expensive. So there's not a lot of time to, to say, that was lovely. Ah, one of the most beautiful phrases I've ever heard. Instead, you're saying, you know, on the, on the fourth beat, you're rushing. Uh, uh, fourth horn, very nice, but kind of flat. Uh, we need to go back and do this again. And uh, so you don't make a lot of friends. But if I don't do that, because I do all of my own post-production and editing, I'm not going to have the material to make the perfect recording. And recordings are not, not concerts. They're created performances. And a good conductor like, like Phil, who knows the art of recording, knows it's a totally different experience that every little detail counts. So in our editing work, sometimes we're manipulating phrases by one millisecond. Now you think, I can't hear one millisecond, but I guarantee you, you could. If I played you an edit and I moved it by one millisecond, it would feel different, it would sound different. So then at the end, we take all the material. So everyone goes home from the sessions, there's a glass of champagne, congratulations, a party. And I go home with a score with 2,000 post-it notes, uh, a pile of hard disks now, it used to be tape, and I have to put it all together. And usually we do multi-tracking, so we have 50 channels. Each channel has a possibility of thousands of parameters that can be set. And uh, yeah, hopefully at the end of all of that work, we have something that you're going to enjoy to listen to, because that's ultimately what it's all about. I wonder, if for, for those of us here who haven't been around a recording session, if you could paint us a little bit of a picture of what it looks like. Uh, we had the wonderful opportunity to do a recording of Brahms at Abbey Road in London, of Beatles fame, with the London Symphony. Maybe you could describe a little bit about what the actual recording space looks like, and then your own space, uh, particularly where you might be working with your partner in crime and great collaborator, your uh, wife well, Tammy. Peter. Yeah, and my wife Tammy, of course. Tammy, Tammy's home in Rotterdam. and. Hi, Tammy. Uh, recordings happen in many places, from living rooms to garages to places like Abbey Road. Now, the funny thing about Abbey Road is 
it is famous indeed because of the Beatles. It was actually built for the British composer Sir Edward Elgar, but it's got a terrible acoustic. We don't like to talk about that. Abby Road, if you're listening, uh, it's got a, let's call it a challenging acoustic. Isn't, that's a better word, yeah? And as, I think as Philip quickly discovered on the podium, that the podium is the worst seat in the house. Uh, he can't really hear what's going on. It's quite boomy. It's, it's a large room, basically. And we hire it because we know it. It's bulletproof. There are no outside noises. They've got a lot of equipment. If something breaks, we can replace it. Uh, it's got a great cafeteria. Uh, these are the important things in music. Yeah, you should never forget that. Uh, musicians, uh, you know, we need, we need food to do our work and, and occasionally a drink. Uh, so it's a large room. Early in the morning, the big London Symphony truck pulls up. Uh, they're loading in the timpanis, the drums. Uh, our guys come. We set up all the equipment inside. And musicians start to filter in, hopefully filter in on time. Uh, the personnel manager comes and says, I've got bad news, Michael, today. Who's sick? Who's not coming? Uh, we go through the list of who's sick, who's not coming, who we can replace them with. Uh, we check all the equipment, we check all the microphones, uh, because even when you have the greatest artists, the greatest studio, something can still go wrong, and it usually does. Uh, I've made over a thousand commercial recordings. I'm still nervous at each and every session. Uh, and then eventually the conductor comes, you know, the stars, and uh, we say, okay, get to work. <laughs> We, we, we give them what my wife calls the fear of God speech. Uh, you've got two hours, you've got to get all this accomplished, and no back talk, please. So. Well, I think we can tell from the joy with which you speak about your, your professional experience why you record. But perhaps a bigger question is, why record at all? Okay, that's a very important question. Uh, most of the artists that I work with never listen to their recordings. Most of them don't like recording, because it's not the same as performing. In a performance, you, you, you give your all, you receive the applause of the audience, and you go home, and maybe three days later, your, your, your best friend says, it really wasn't very good, but you have a few days to, to bask. Uh, recording is very detailed work. Sometimes we record note by note, bar by bar, bar by miserable bar. People get frustrated. Uh, the studios are generally badly heated or cooled. Uh, there's a lot of sweat. <laughs> I was going to say that the studios don't smell good, but I thought maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't go there because you have a lot of people in a small space for a long time. Uh, the main reason to record is it makes you a better musician. The process forces you to listen. You may think, uh, if you're, any of you are musicians here and you record yourself, what you hear in that recording may be quite different from your perception of your performance. It's like when you speak. We all hate our voices when we hear them recorded. Uh, we hear everything through our mental perception of who we are, the music we make, and technically through the bone conduction. So as a clarinet player, I don't really hear what I sound like. I'm hearing it through the, the bones in, my, in, my, in my, my mouth and my jaw. So recording, there's a, a sort of mean guy like me who's there pushing a button to stop every few seconds if necessary, and saying, that's not good, that's not right, try this, try that. Uh, now, I have to say, it sounds very dictatorial and authoritarian. The real goal is to get into the artist's head and give them back what they hear. It's got nothing to do with my musical taste or sensibilities. Don't worry, I have them, but I try not to let them get in the way, because it is really about the artist. So. I try to get a sense very quickly of what the artist wants, and I try to give that back to them. But sometimes that means stepping on their toes. And, and, uh, and, but with a good trusting relationship, I'm, I'm very proud that uh, almost all of my artists don't even come back to listen. They don't want to waste the time. They'd rather work. And, uh, and, that's a, and when an artist comes to me and says, you know, that sounds like me, then I've done my job correctly. You know, as an artist, the most conspicuous absence at a session would be the audience. Now, and the audience may be in our, our minds or even the ears in the booth or just the musicians participating in the performance. But there is a presence that is unique to this setting, and that is the clock. 
There are no clocks at performances. And I wonder uh, what your relationship with time is as a producer. Is time a resource? Is it a parameter? Is it an adversary? How do you approach time? That's a wonderful question. How we approach time in general. They always say that as we get older, time speeds up. I have to say, for me, it slows down. No idea what that means. Uh, but yeah, I have a great working relationship with the clock. Now, in the American environment, it's quite tough. And I'm, I'm a, a member of the American Federation of Musicians, so I'm not knocking the brothers here. But uh, in the United States, with a symphony orchestra under the normal national recording contract, if you employ the orchestra for a three-hour recording session, it's two hours, because they get 20 minutes break per hour. The 20 minutes can, you can start 20 minutes late, you can end 20 minutes early, but you've got to have one hour of break. A four hours, no, it's three hours and 20 minutes, I made a mistake. A four hour session is a three hour session, that, that works. Uh, and you cannot go even a second over. And by the American Union rules, there are clock stations on the stage. Everyone has to see the clock. And the moment I say thank you, is when the clock stops. And if that thank you was one second over, well, my record label has to pay a lot of money in union overtime. And in America, overtime comes in half hour packages with a 10 minute break, and quite expensive. And I was doing a recording once many, many years ago in Phoenix, Arizona, and the clock was running down. And I usually ask my wife at the one minute, almost like a, like a warning in football, tell me when one minute comes. At 30 seconds, start counting down. And we always, we always check our watch with the union representative at the beginning to make sure that we are exactly correct. Well, the last note hadn't finished playing when the second hand came around. And I said, thank you very much. When I had to edit that, I think I spent a week just trying to notch my voice out and have the musical phrase continue. And there's an, there's an old, you know, the Metropolitan Opera, if you go past midnight, it's vastly expensive because there are five, I think there are five unions in the house. And in the 50s, there was an old German conductor named Fritz Stiedry. And the musicians knew they could slow him down to get past midnight, one second past midnight, and it was party time for everyone. And, you know, musicians can slow conductors down. And, you know, he can, he can push, but isn't going to happen. So after a few months, they had to fire this poor man because they couldn't afford it. When James Levine came to the Met, he often did the opera Parsifal, which is quite long. And I remember uh, Jim once holding the last chord like this, looking at his watch, and one second before midnight, he cut the orchestra off. And he was, he was making a point, no, no question about it, but uh, so in my work, my wife often jokes that I can tell her exactly at the first day of sessions at what exact second each recording session will end. But that's because I'm managing it. Well, you, we have the pressure of the clock. You mentioned the things that might be surprise news from a personnel manager at the top of a recording session. Yeah. We've got the uh, interesting personalities of musicians and conductors and everybody at play. Surely this must occasionally result in some stressful situations, some volatility. Have you ever been nervous as a producer to see how things were going to really come out? I, I, I bet you've seen some things. Well, you know, I'm actually 105 years old, but I look great for my age. But no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all the stress. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of things. I mean, I, there are far too many stories, but I remember once we signed at Deutsche Grammophon a wonderful young German soprano. And we met for lunch in Paris, and she told me she was from Berlin. It was her lifelong dream to record for Deutsche Grammophon. And I said, I was very happy to make that happen. And we scheduled her first recordings. The first was going to be with the Berlin Philharmonic and Claudio Abado, the late great maestro. And the second was going to be with now the late Pierre Boulez. And we were going to record in a church in Berlin. And I got there with the team, and the orchestra was waiting, and Abado was there, and the soprano's not there. So I called her up and said, where's the limousine? I said, well, you live two blocks from the building. Uh, you could take a taxi. You could also walk, but we're all waiting. And I, I say this because when we had the lunch, she told us she didn't want to be a diva. She wanted to be just a normal, <laughs> down-to-earth. And uh, 
So I walked over to Obado and said, she's waiting for the limousine. He just started to laugh, and he told the musicians, and they started to laugh, and she came, and we made a nice recording. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are moments like that. That, wasn't, that was more funny than, than stressful in the end. Well, you've just mentioned Deutsche Grammophon again, and that, to me, sounds like a dream job. Was it yours? You know, many times I've, I've taken jobs before asking people whether I should or not. <laughs> and, and Deutsche Grammophon was certainly one of those. It's, uh, if you can imagine having in, in one small space almost all the top musicians in classical music, many of whom don't really like each other or pretend to like each other but have no respect for each other, uh, where the staff were perhaps as demanding as the artists, I had one producer actually walk out on a session and he told Maria Joel Pires that he didn't like the way she played Bach. No, that really wasn't his job. Uh, I've also had to go to babysit sessions with other producers because of the volatility of, of the artists. Uh, but I have to tell you how the job happened. I was working for an American independent record label uh, and I was getting a little bored and I made a deal where I could work from home mainly. And uh, my wife said, well, you do have to work, you realize that, don't you? So what would you like to do, if you could do anything? And I said, well, I'd love to be the head of music at Deutsche Grammophon, it's the oldest record label in the world. Uh, incredible history, great artists, my grandfather collected the recordings, uh, and that was that. Now, I had an office in New York, which I never went to, and a phone that rang that I never answered, and I, but I had to go in because I'd left something behind the other day. And the phone jingled. Okay, hello. And a very posh voice said they were calling from, uh, from Universal Music in London, or it wasn't Universal, then it was another company, but would I be interested in being the head of music at Deutsche Grammophon? And I said, oh, you're, my wife is incredible. She organized this whole thing. And I said, yeah, lovely. He said, could I come to Hamburg in the next few days? I said, anything you say. And, and, and uh, he said he would come to New York, actually, to, to meet me tomorrow. Lovely. So I go home. What happened today at work? Uh, you don't know? <laughs> but I thought I'd play along. So when I went to meet this guy, I was so relaxed and cool because I just thought it was a joke. They'd never hired an American. Uh, it just, it, the, the culture was so old world. But I went to Hamburg, and when the guy gave me the ticket, I thought it was going to say happy birthday on the back or, you know, <laughs> something funny. But I went, and I, I, I still went with the idea there was some trick behind all of this. And they offered me the job on the spot and said, uh, can, can, can you start next week? And so I said, sure. And I did. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask just one more question and then we can open it up from the audience questions. And that's that while we've talked about your role as a producer, that's not why you actually find yourself in Little Rock this week. Right. You're here for the world premiere of your Suite for Strings as the composer. And you have a unique perspective as a professional listener, as a performer, to come to composition later than most composers. And mm. how, how does that influence what, how you, you uh, undertake your role as a composer, knowing that you have this experience and you've been a producer? It should help. <laughs> I, I, I learned something, uh, just to make a long story short, uh, three years ago my wife was diagnosed with a, a cancer called multiple myeloma. And I... I just needed something she suggested. I, I kind of get a hobby, but I'm not really good at many things. I'm, I'm kind of good at music, I guess. So, uh, and I was on a train that broke down on a bridge in Dordrecht in the Netherlands. My cell phone was out of battery. I didn't have a book. I was in a bad mood. But I had some music paper in my backpack. And the train wasn't going anywhere and it was on a bridge so we couldn't get off. So I just began to write a piece for flute and strings. And I called it Skipping Stones because it made me think of when I was a kid and liked to skip stones across the water. And that piece was, uh, I sent it to a friend of mine who sent it to somebody else, and the piece was premiered in California last summer. Uh, but what I learned is I make composing mistakes that I would catch immediately as a recording producer and probably slam the guy. You know, you can't do that. You can't write that. It's a different part of the brain. And I've talked to a number of composers uh, so I only began composing three years ago. And the piece that the Arkansas Symphony and Phil are playing is the first piece for orchestra that I ever wrote. 
Uh, on the other hand, because I'm something of a professional in recording, I don't like to write things that are going to give the musicians too much trouble. I try to be, try to be kind. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a very famous violinist said, make it challenging, make it impossible for us. It gives us more incentive to play it. So now I'm adding a few ch technical difficulties for no really good musical reason <laughs> in the new pieces I'm writing. Uh, but writing music happens because you have to do it. It's inside of you, and, it, and as I was telling Philip when I, uh, I recently was at a performance in Korea, and the musicians had questions, and I said, well, play it any way you like, change anything you want, but I realized I didn't mean that. I did have a very definite idea in my head about how this music should sound, but music in your head is very different than real musicians playing the music. And the, the real reason I wanted to come, of course, it's, it's, it's fun and it's exciting, but I wanted to hear the rehearsal to hear if what was in my head actually works, and I won't know till this afternoon, and then I can either kind of slink out and catch a flight back or, 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 or stay, but this is the composer's workshop. Real musicians taking your music and making something of it. And the other good thing, and I said this to, uh, to uh, some people this week, good musicians save bad composers. Good musicians will take whatever nonsense we write and try to make it as beautiful and as musical as possible. So thank you for them. As you listen to your pieces performed or rehearsed, do you foresee that you would make any adjustments based on what you hear or what the orchestra or musicians are telling you, or is it beyond that now? Well, probably my lips will be, you know, I'll be shaking and incapable of speech, but uh, assuming I can, I can utter a squeak out, I'm not planning on changing, changing anything unless, unless Phil says, if you don't change it, we're not playing the piece. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is crazy, but it's a bit of a, it's a theoretic, when you write music, m music exists in two realms, in, in people's minds and imaginations, and when musicians actually play it. And uh, I, I know what I'm hearing in my head. I mean, it, maybe it's not any good, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm hearing. And it definitely, almost all composers have a voice. So you can, I mean, my wife says she can always tell one of my recordings, no matter who's playing. It just is a certain sound. Uh, and if you hear one note of Beethoven, even one note, you know it's Beethoven. All the umpas and Verdi operas before arias, you can tell what the aria is, you know. So my music has a voice, and it may be a kind of funny, silly, sometimes uh, uh, a me voice. <laughs> but it's my voice, and, and if you're going to play my music, I'm afraid you're stuck with it. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Would you care to name an orchestra that you edited least? Say again? Is there an orchestra that you edited very little? Well, like? that's an interesting question, too, because You'd like to think that if it was a great recording session, you don't need to do a lot of editing. It's actually the opposite. A bad recording session, you get by by, what do they say, the skin of your, your teeth, something like that, I can't remember the expression. Uh, you've done three takes, the last one is barely acceptable. Okay, you put it together, you try all the tricks to hide the bad things. With a really great performance where an artist can always do it a little better, you end up having more takes, more material, and it's more difficult to put them together because, oh, I love this note, I love this note, and I want... The choice becomes extremely difficult with great artists. You have enough material to make five different recordings, and you have to make one, and this is where you beat yourself up when you have great artists. So, uh, I mean, recording, I made the Vienna Philharmonic's first recording ever of Alban Berg's violin concerto, so there was a certain responsibility, get it right, uh, but I had so much good material that I really, you know, and I've worked my life out that I can actually do a lot of editing at home now. So I can get up in the middle of the night and, and wander over to the part of my house devoted to this and make changes, and then in the morning not like them and do it again. So the better the artist, the more work, but it's good work, it's good editing, so. I'd like to ask a little follow-up on that. I mean, how do you, 
how do you come to resolution on the choices that you've made? Because when you have had a good session, it's almost as if the material becomes personified, where all of those different takes have different personalities, different reasons to love them. And ultimately, you have to choose who you love more and put the others aside. And that's very difficult. I mean, uh, it is very difficult. And each, as you ask for the takes in the session, by the tone of voice you, that I use, I often get different results. Anger, you know, we've got to get this now, produces a different kind of result than you know, that last take was so beautiful, but I think we can do a little better kind of thing, you know, and uh, that gets a different result. And uh, the other thing is that pitch changes. So that sometimes if you begin a recording at nine in the morning, by the time one o'clock rolls around, it's sharper. That violinists tend to go sharp. And so you can't put those materials together without a, a lot of work you can. Uh, but the choosing is the hard part especially when you have good material. And you know, in the end, sometimes an artist will say, I thought we had a better take of that section. Then you make it louder and you play it for them again, and that usually works. Uh, there are a lot of tricks in our work. I hide bad things. I mean, not everything can be perfect, and there are ways to hide them. Uh, but yes, uh, choosing is very much a sleep deprivation activity. And this is fanatic work. It takes me generally between 60 and 80 hours to edit a 60 minute recording, three or four days to mix. And those 60 hours are intense. And you talk about the experience of time. You start doing it and you, know, you realize you haven't slept and you've sat there in your pajamas with headphones on uh, and you didn't, don't realize you haven't had a meal because it's very intense. You're in the headphones, you're focused really on the score in front of you. The, the, now it's on a computer screen, the notes and putting it all together. And, uh, and then the other thing is you, you can do that and then say, this was terrible. And you start all over again, so. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, one of the ways I can not have to do that, because let's say you're recording a symphony orchestra, the artists are not in isolation, uh, so that Yes, I can change the pitch on the second clarinet microphone, but the first clarinet microphone is picking him up too. So I use, I manipulate overtones with different reverberations. Uh, I'm not going to get too technical here, and I also don't want you copying these great ideas of mine. But, uh, <laughs> but they're, and also if, if, if a note is, is not pleasantly in tune, if I make it just a little bit softer, you don't notice it as much or I raise another instrument around it, you don't notice it as much. So those are all the things that we do to compensate for it. Things that just, there's a very, very famous singer, uh, I'm sure almost everyone knows his name, and his voice was a bit short on the top, vocally. And my colleague Hans Weber at Deutsche Grammophon said in this snotty German accent, you sing it as high as you can and we will do the rest. He's no longer with us, so uh, I'm not going to get in trouble for that one. The, the singer is, though. <laughs> so, thank you. I was an elementary music teacher for 20 years for the Little Rock School District. Great. Thank you. And I am seeing an alarming trend across this country, and that is the reduction of music and arts programs in our public schools. And it's very disturbing. What do you think we can do about that to remedy this situation? Well, my, my wife started also as a school music teacher and poor towns in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and I've heard her stories about bringing Kodai instruments and really getting the kids excited. And the fact that she was really hot in 20-something probably didn't hurt, but <laughs> Tammy. Uh, it's interesting you say that because I do a lot of work in Asia, in, uh, in South Korea, Japan, and China. Everything you don't see happening here is actually happening there. There the audience is growing. Uh, someone in Korea told me classical music is cool in Korea. The audiences are packed with kids. If, if you're a classical musician and you want to feel like a rock star, perform in Asia. Cheering, screaming. I, I was once in the, the main hall in Seoul, the Seoul Arts Center, and I saw all these teenage kids with their camera phones, and I wondered who was, who was in there. It was a conductor, surrounded by, by, by the adulation of teenage kids. I had a 12-year-old 
I'm guessing 12, come up to me in Korea and ask for an autograph three weeks ago. I said, who do you think I am? I said, you made all those wonderful recordings with Maestro Chung and the Soulful Harmonic. I said, you know that? Yes, I have them all. And I said, you should really ask the maestro to sign your, your CD. Oh, no, I want you. And I thought, that's amazing. Also, uh, you know, sometimes when I travel with my clarinet, if I tell them it's a saxophone, the TSA understands. I've never had to tell them what it was in, in Asia or in Europe. So what I see happening is I see a real diminishing of music training in America and a tremendous loss, the power of music. I think we all remember that first moment when we heard music of any kind and it touched us. It's, kids aren't getting that here anymore. In Asia, the top of society, so the former president of South Korea, Lee myung Bak, uh, we played the Beethoven Ninth for his inauguration. At the end of the inauguration, the conductor handed his baton to the president in a gesture that was so powerful. On the front page of everything, the gesture said, it's up to you to protect the arts. Uh, I've seen this happen in most of the Asian countries that I work in. Uh, here we're embarrassed. We think it's elitist. We think that, uh, you know, I, mean, you, I, I remember even me, 1992, uh, one of the years I was nominated for a Grammy as Classical Producer of the Year. So we're standing in line to get our tickets, the nominees, and everyone's, you know, hi, what do you do, what do you do? And I was always so shy, you know, oh, Classical Producer of the Year, because there were all these big, big pop artists there. And, uh, and then I discovered that they were thrilled about what I did, and they wanted to talk about music, and they wanted to talk about chord changes, and can you check my piece out? And uh, I discovered that we were, we were all doing the same thing. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to build it's extremely easy to destroy. All the work that's been done in this country by great music teachers like yourself and my wife, all that work can be destroyed in an instant. And when that goes, there are repercussions. All these kids that are graduating from conservatory, they can't get work because there's no weddings for the orchestra. Uh, the simple enrichment that children get, that uh, one positive thing, maybe, 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 they say that if you have a good experience as a child hearing music, years later, you're married, you have children, you've got some time on your hands, you'll come back. Uh, but they have to get that as, as children. And without that, I think we're, we're, we're lost. And I, I, how to make it better? It's leadership. It has to come from the top of society. It has to come from as in Korea, a president. Uh, another story, when the Soviet Union was falling apart, uh, Gorbachev was at a performance of War and Peace at the Mariinsky Theater with Valery Gergiev conducting. And Gergiev, who I've worked with quite a lot, said to me, he, all these people were coming up whispering in, in Gorbachev's ear, sir, you have to leave. The Soviet Union is falling apart. And Gorbachev stayed. And he told Gergiev after, he said, I cannot disrespect the music. Now, is it a true story? I, I, I tend to think it is, because I know, I know several of the people involved in the story. Uh, but this sense of respect for the arts. Uh, let me give you some statistics also. And sorry if I, I waste a lot of time on this, but I think it's important. Uh, there, in Germany and Holland, I live in the Netherlands. There are studies. Should there be uh, a symphony orchestra in our city paid for by the taxpayers? So the last polling was about four or five years ago. 75% of the city said, absolutely. They then polled, they said, do you go to the symphony? The people that said no, they asked them the same question. Do you think it should be supported by the taxpayers? Same percentage said yes. The people believe it's important to have this. It, it's part of having a, 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 a nice place to live, a civilized town. And I, I met the guy who was the head of all the theaters in Germany. He said they did the same polling in Germany, uh, and they had the same results. People want it, need it. And it's, it's a lie to say you can't have the symphony in a children's hospital. It's simply not true. It's simply not true. And, and it, there's, there's good evidence. There's some books written in the Netherlands about this, unfortunately in Dutch. But uh, I, I like to believe what we do isn't a frill. 
I like to think it, it's essential. Uh, and that's something, the difference between the American model, now my guess is because of the taxpayer deduction, America probably gives more money to the arts than the European countries. I and mean, we, we don't see it that way in Europe because we say the government doesn't give any money, but they're giving it via the deduction. Lost revenue to the IRS, I guess. Not that I care so much about that, but uh, in Europe it's taxpayer, almost 100%. The difference there is that the arts become the center of discussion. It's bipartisan support, no matter whether it's left of center, right of center, in power, in the city, and it's there. You're paying for it. And uh, I, I like to think that we can develop a mixed model of public support and private support. Neither Europe nor America has found the balance yet. But you don't want to lose this, and you have to fight for it. You want your children to have what you had the experience, and uh, believe me, it's worth fighting for. I was interested, I was interested in your experience as a child. How, what brought you into the musical world? Uh, that's good, because I always try to say something about grandpa, and I didn't, uh, I didn't find the moment, but I was raised by my Russian grandfather, who was born in Nizhny Novgorod, later Gorky, and grandpa was a watchmaker, but a music lover. And we listened intensely together. And we didn't listen to his background music. He had these two big red, extraordinarily ugly and uncomfortable chairs that we had to sit in in front of these big old speakers. And we would listen, and we didn't talk. When it was over, we talked. And even though grandpa was not educated as a musician, he was educated as a listener. And Grandpa and I talked through music for all of my young life, and that is the entirety of my training. I have no formal music education. It's thanks to Grandpa. Thank you, Grandpa. And uh, listening to you talk about some of the musicians that you have worked with, uh, I got the impression that uh, professional musicians may be uh, a lot more temperamental than than the average person on the street. Is that right or wrong? Well, they're like everybody else. They're, they're, they're nice guys, not nice guys, crazy guys. I, what, one, one, uh, I will say this, the greater the musician, the easier to work with, without, without question. Whether it was Leonard Bernstein, who I had a wonderful working relationship with, or Herbert von Karajan, or uh, the better the musician, the more secure and that security translates into uh, a rather nice person to work with. But I, there was one very famous conductor in, 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 in Rotterdam, where I live, the concert hall is attached by a bridge to the hotel, which is next door. So the conductor said he wanted a large white limousine to take him from the hotel to the concert hall. Now, so that would mean the limousine would come to the front and barely be able to negotiate a 90 degree turn for about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet and be at the stage door. And I, you know, I felt obliged to point this out to Maestro. Limousine. So limousine came, the guy could barely make the turn, and then Maestro told him to wait till the end of the concert to take him back at the end. Now we could have walked across a bridge and never even gone outside and got his beautiful hair, you know, m messed up. But uh, that was unusual, I have to say. Most, most of the people I work with are professionals. And I remember once I did a recording with uh, the actress Meryl Streep, the narration to the Ravel Ma Mère and Poulenc's Babar, and this is a long time ago, so she said, uh, Michael, do you have a cassette of, I could play for my daughter so I could let her know what mommy did at work today? That's it. You know, we're, 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 all, guys, we're all guys coming to work. I mean, we're very lucky that our work happens to be in music, uh, but, and we're, we're also doing it for other people to hear. So in a sense, we, we have a boss, and the boss is the public. Well, you just referenced cassette tapes, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the role of technology and how it's changed yeah. your industry. No recording session is really complete without a, a rap uh, 
party or something with maybe some scotch and cigars when invariably somebody's going to wax nostalgic about the days of cutting tape, or maybe it's more like fetching, but yeah. we know that it's changed quite a bit. And as you answer that, would you mind also addressing this new popular culture movement of people that are asking for a return to vinyl and, and former methods of recording? Technology is fallible. That's one important thing. I was at a, one of these dinners, parties, after a, a recording session, and I was sitting next to a longtime colleague, Volpeter Karbatki, made all the great Karia and Bernstein recordings with me for uh, other people for Deutsche Grammophon. And uh, I saw his face, he, his phone rang, and I saw his, he look at somebody on his left, and then his sort of face dropped. And what I found out had happened was the, we had left the assistants to copy the material. In fact, they had erased it. And he didn't want to tell me and disturb my party, which was very kind of him, by the way. Thank you, Wolf Dieter. And what he didn't tell any of us was that he made a private backup for himself. So it was covered. So technology is fallible no matter what you have. Uh, I cut tape with a razor blade. Uh, it was easy in those days because the noise floor of analog was so high that it covered all the edits. Uh, I like digital. I don't like vinyl. Uh, every time you play an LP, your needle stylus is wearing out the vinyl. So every time you play it, it's going to sound a little different. And to a, a lunatic like me, it's going to sound a lot different. Uh, vinyl comes with distortion, automatic distortion. It's built in. At the beginning of digital, we made very ugly recordings. They were harsh, they were crude. Everyone said digital is terrible. We make very good digital recordings now, uh, high definition recordings that I am I'm very happy with. And I did a parallel session with a film doing a recording in both analog to tape and digital. And uh, my conclusion was the digital was better, but that's just my taste. The record labels are happy to sell both. It's, uh, we have uh, a world premiere coming up on Thursday, and I want to make sure everybody is aware that the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra at 7 p.m. on Thursday at St. James United Methodist Church in West Little Rock. You'll have the opportunity to be the, amongst the first to hear Michael's new suite for strings as part of our Arkansas Symphony Orchestra Intimate Neighborhood Concert Series, Inc. Series. Michael, it's been a true pleasure, enlightening and interesting as always. Thank you for joining us Thank today. you. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you for coming. Good. I was gonna, I was gonna get on to you, Philip, if you didn't promote the 7 p.m. Thursday at St. James, uh, because I think that's great. Michael, thank you for coming to Arkansas. Philip, always great to partner with you. We're proud of the symphony, the great work you're doing. Thank you all for coming. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>